Y'all ain't afraid of no rain, are you? What rain, man? I'm going to church. That's what's up. I love it so much. I love it so much. So before I get too ahead of myself, I just want to take a moment, introduce myself. My name is Elliot, my wife Tiffany, and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Come on, give it up for yourselves. You are amazing. We love you. You, you are my favorite church, and that's a good thing, right? <laughs> You're my favorite church. Plenty of great churches in town, but this one's my favorite, my favorite one. And I just want to take an extra moment to... Uh, to welcome all of our first-time visitors. Some, if, you, if you're here for the very first time, or maybe it's your second or third visit, you still feel a little newish, I just want to take a minute and celebrate you. Come on, church. Can we just welcome everyone who's visiting today? What a blessing and honor. What a blessing and honor it is that you would choose to share your Sunday morning with us. And it's a, it's a big choice where you're going to spend Sunday morning. So we're, we're taking that responsibility to, to bring God's word and to, and to usher in his spirit very, very greatly. So uh, we're just so excited to see you here. Uh, we have a mission here at the church. You can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline. That's right. By leading people to becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. That's what we're so excited about. That's why we get all excited and all whoop, whoop. That's what we're about, man. We want to make lifelong followers of Jesus. Man, this is no, more than a feeling. This is a lifelong discipleship lifestyle that we want to bring to our community. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, just real quick before we jump into today's message, I want, to, I want to bring some things to your attention that you're probably aware of, like Easter's coming. I don't know if you knew that. Easter's coming. Is anybody excited for Easter this year? Like... Some people are, but I mean, the rest of you, you'll, you'll get excited. You'll get excited the more you hear about it. Um, so this year for Easter, you may have noticed a little card that you sat on that we're having two services for Easter this year. One is at 9 o'clock and one is at 1030. Everyone say 9. nine. Everyone say 1030. 1030. You're not going to come at 10, are you? Well, even if you do, you'll be here early for the 1030 service and we'll just, we'll talk with you outside. It's going to be great. We want to make enough room for all of your friends and family. You guys have been bringing all your friends already, and it's looking great. We love it. We love it so, so much, and we want to make sure there's plenty of room to invite those friends and family so that they can be a part of all the fun stuff we have going on. Another thing that we have going on is the day before Easter. That's the 8th of April, I believe. It's a Saturday. We're partnering with the city of Lodi at Hutchins Street Square to put on their annual egg hunt. Come on, who is excited at Lifeline Church? Man, Lifeline Church is the sole volunteer force behind this event where last year, even in the rain, we had 800 people come out to that event. It's absolutely wonderful. And if it's sun shining, you can expect that over 1,000 people will be there with their families, their kids, and nothing but Lifeline t-shirts as far as the eye can see. It's a wonderful opportunity the, the day before Easter to be a lifeline in the community. That's what we're all about. We want to be seen being a lifeline and ushering in God's love and showing people that it's, it's with no agenda, it's with no strings attached that we're gonna bring love and bless the city of Lodi. So I want you to, before you leave this house today, there's a table in the back and we reserve tables in the back. Very, very rarely do we do that, but there's a table in the back that I would love for you to put your name on to say, you know what, I'll be there. In some capacity, I'll show up, I'll be a part of this event so that we can communicate with you, so that we can let you know we get a shirt size, so we can give you one of the shirts that we're going to get for this event so that you could be a part of this really, really fun event that we have the, the privilege to partner with the city of Lodi. Come on, that is so cool. So I'm really excited. Just go ahead and see Adam and Kaylee Schmidt in the back. They'll be back there ready to help you guys out, ready to answer any questions. And of course, you can sign up. For everything that we do here at the church through the, um, the Church Center app. The Church Center app is the way, like, if you don't, like, just go Google it, all right? Get on your app store. You know, it's the iTunes store or it's the superior uh, Google Play. You know, if you got a Samsung, you know, then that's, that's how you would do that. Amen. Amen. And you can download that app, the Church Center app, and then call Lifeline your home, and then you can sign up for it that way. Okay, okay, I want you to go ahead and get out your, uh, your message notes. Go ahead and get out that bulletin that we gave to you. And I just wanna, one more thing, just one more thing. As you're getting ready, as you're getting your Bible out, as you're getting everything going, I just wanna let you know, it's, it's, we're gonna have baptisms in one month. So if you 
have been you know, saved recently, like you've been with us for a couple of months and you got saved in a service recently, I just want to let you know, in one month from now, just after Easter, we are going to have an opportunity for you to get water baptized with us. Water baptism is simply an outward expression of an inward decision that you made. And it would be our honor and our privilege to take that step with you. So what you can do is you can take out one of those connection cards and you can check right on there. I'm, I'm ready to get water baptized. I'm ready to go public with my faith. I'm ready to go public with my faith. Quick story about my baptism. My baptism. I was so new to the church when I got baptized, I didn't even know I was supposed to keep my shirt on. I'm just telling you right now, it doesn't matter if you haven't been coming to church that long. If you, if you have a new relationship with Christ, this is your next step. It's your next step. So go ahead and take out that connection card. I know I just painted a picture for some of you today. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it's on the connection card. You can check water baptism on there. It's one month away. Come on, who's ready for God's word today? Anybody? Amen. It's going to be good. Easter is going to be good. We've got a lot of fun days coming up, but how many of you have ever had a bad day? Anybody ever had a bad day? Come on. Whoa, okay. Hands across America. Let's go. Hey, bad day. Let me tell you about a bad day I have, and when I was raising my hand for a bad day, maybe you see the evidence of a bad day I had. I'm missing a digit right there. Maybe you've noticed. Um, and I, have I ever told you guys the story of this? So I was vacationing in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, uh, there was this beautiful woman swimming out in the, in the ocean. And so I swam out to save her, of course. And then sharks, sharks were swimming around. And so I went down under the water and I started knocking these sharks out, punching them, bam, 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 bam. And one of them was coming at me like this and I uppercut that shark. No, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. What really happened was, how many stories do I want to tell? <laughs> the clock is running. I'll just save you from, I'll save some stories for later. What really happened is that I was in a drug rehab program. All right, believe it or not, that's actually yes, that's the actual story. So if you're new here, I got you got to pass through the past. All right, I got to pass. I'm just getting that out of the way right now. It's, it's been a while. Okay, I'm doing better now. Doing a lot better now. But back in the day, I was in a drug program, Salvation Army in Stockton, California, and I was working in one of those. Yeah, that's right. Come on, let's give it up. I know we got some Sally boys in the house. Come on, respect respect and I was riding on one of those big white box trucks you know the ones that doing the most good trucks yeah you've seen them you've seen them I was riding on the back because I thought I was so cool I thought it was so cool and um I'm, I'm sitting on the back and we're in a we're in like a trailer park situation so we're just going really slow going around and and one of the couches that we had stood up fell at me when I was sitting down on the tailgate it was a big heavy solid wood couch and it's fallen at me and I jump out of the way and it lands right on my finger and just splatters my finger out like shredded beef that's what it looked like to me shredded beef hanging down there go, 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 go. just like that it was so painful but here's the thing I was in a drug program so no pain meds and no bed rest you can either go to jail or you can stay in this program and work. And this is what happened when they took me to San Joaquin General. They said that it was like this. It was hanging down just like this. And it was dangling with fingers. It had fingers of its own, just like that. <laughs> and I went to San Joaquin General. They found out I had no insurance. So you know what they did? They said, ah, it doesn't look so bad. They propped it up, put a bandage around it, patted me on the butt and said, you can go. You're good to go. I had a rotting piece of flesh on my finger, only connected by the nerve by the nerve. It's like a half-cooked piece of spaghetti noodle that was, you know, that y'all happy you came to church today? Grossed out. Grossed out. And I had to work the next day. I had to work with my hands because in love, they're like, Elliot, we're so sorry. We love you, but you, you have to come to work. That's the policy here. You have to work. There is no bed rest. And so come on, wave all five fingers at me if you've ever had a bad day. Anybody had a bad day? All five fingers. Yes, not as bad as mine. Yeah, I see, I see someone going like this. That means something different here. Okay. Let me just tell you, I had some choice words. I had some choice words when that event happened to me. I'm not going to repeat those words because this is church and this is a safe place. But I had some words in that moment. And that's what this series is all about, words. This is about the last words of Jesus. And we're going to discuss some of these last words because... How many of you know, the last words that somebody speaks are important, especially if they know they're the last words. You know, Jesus knew his last days were coming, and he had some choice words to share with us. So we want to we see when Jesus was in his bad day, what were, some of the worst, what were some of those last words that he had? Hebrews 12, let's get into this. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. You in a bad day? You in a bad situation? Let's study how he did it. 
Let's study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Watch this, the cross, the shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. Listen, we call it Good Friday, that Friday right before Easter. We call it Good Friday for some reason. That was Jesus' worst day on earth where he had to face the most pain, the most shame, the most humiliation, the most rejection. I can't even talk about it. It's, it's just, when you picture it, when you think about it, it's, it's not, it was good for us, not good for him. He was betrayed, arrested, tried at night, which was illegal, beaten, tortured, and he put up with that cross when he says this teachable statement, which were found among his last words. Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Can you believe it? Father, forgive them. He's hanging on the cross. He had just experienced the most pain. And he said, Father, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Let me tell you something about about me. If I was beaten like that, if I was humiliated like that, if I was rejected like that, and I'm hanging up on that cross with all the power of heaven in me, you know what I'd say? You dead? You dead? Y'all dead? I'm like calling down fire and brimstone on all these fools. Let me me just put it in perspective. Jesus said, forgive them on a cross. We lose our minds in traffic. Come on. Let's be honest with each other. Jesus said, forgive them when he was facing what he faced, which is so incredible. And we lose it when someone do- looks at us the wrong way. We have trouble forgiving them. We, we, rem- we remember it for years. We remember it for years. It's the first thing that we need to remember during troubling times. Write this in your notes. Forgive people who are treating you unjustly. To forgive people who are treating you unjustly. That's the lesson here. Listen, is some people's spiritual gift to make you feel miserable. It just is. Let me tell you something. They went through step two of our growth track and they took a personality profile and they took a spiritual gifts test and the results are in. Their spiritual gift is to make you miserable. It's to ruin your day. Isn't there just some people like that? They just bother you. They get under your skin. They treat you the wrong way. They, they, they just make you so frustrated. It's like this, their spiritual gift. It's gonna happen. Offenses are gonna come. Need for forgiveness is going to come. People are going to do you wrong. And you want me to be more positive in church? Well, I'm positive it's going to happen. I'm positive someone's going to rub you the wrong way, maybe even right here in church. Because guess what? We're all humans here. It happens. And I am positive about this. Listen to Matthew 24, 10. It says, and then many will be offended and betray one another, and they will hate one another. And then Luke 17, 1. Then he said to his disciples, it is impossible (laughs) <laughs> it is impossible that no offenses should come. It's impossible that no offenses should come. Offenses are coming, and what do we normally do? We take that offense, we take that, that harm that they did to us, and we wrap up in it like a warm blanket. Ooh, I feel so good. Yeah, they did me so wrong. They did me dirty. And we wrap up in that warm blanket of offense, and we say, oh, I'll show them for doing me wrong. I'm going to sit over here and be miserable and live a miserable life. That'll show them. What is it with us? Like we drink poison thinking the other person's going to die. What is it about us that thinking holding on to the resentment, that holding on to the anger, that refusing to release people and forgiving them is somehow going to make us feel better? Jesus teaches us this is not the way. This is not the way. Listen to this. Write this in your notes if you're taking notes. If you're not taking notes, write this down. (laughs) unforgiveness doesn't destroy them it destroys you it destroys you unforgiveness destroys you it's not even about them so much it's about you it's about you listen to proverbs 18 19 an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars so well you know what unfilling a prison for yourself and living in it That's what offense and and living in that offense and unforgiveness is like building a prison for yourself. I have a story that that paints this picture really well. I've told this story before, but there's no better story than this one. You're not going to believe it. Um, There's a man back in the uh, uh, 1649, and uh, his name was Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell. And what Oliver Cromwell wanted to do, this was during the English Civil War. This is over in England, so you know this is going to be a funky story already. (laughs) I thought that was, in my mind, that was funnier. 
Was, whatever. So it's the English Civil War, 1649. Oliver Cromwell, what he wanted to do is he wanted to overthrow the, the monarch party. So King Charles I was in power, and he wanted, you know, all this king, queen stuff, I'm over that. Oliver Cromwell comes in and says, I'm going to overthrow them, and he succeeds. He succeeds. Oliver Cromwell, it's like the, the like you know how our, our constitution was written and the Declaration of Independence and the people who were signing were actually committing treason. Well, he, they did that too. They had, he got 59 people, Oliver Cromwell got 59 people to sign a petition to, to commit uh, King Charles to death. 59 people. And for 11 years, everything was going great. Oliver Cromwell was there. Everything was going good. But then guess who comes into power? King Charles II, also known as King Charles I's son. Okay, can you imagine the resentment? Can you imagine the buildup, the, the revenge, the hatred that's building up? And King Charles II overthrows Oliver Cromwell and his thing. And, it, and they get it back, the, the monarch, because obviously it's still going on like that. And he gets it back. And this is what he does. This is what King Charles II does. He says, bring me every one of those 59 people that signed that petition. We're gonna, we're gonna torture them. We're gonna beat them. We're gonna put them to death. Well, Everything would have been great, except 15 of them had already died. And you know what he said? Not good enough. What I want you to do is I want you to go dig up their bodies. Of those 15 people that signed that document, I want you to dig up their bodies and bring them before me. We're going to put them on trial. They're like, you mean like the skeletons? He said, that's right, the skeletons. This is a true story. They, they bring the skeletons, the moldy, crusty skeletons of these dead people, and they said, what do you have to say for yourself? Guilty, and they, they hung them from the gallows. Talk about digging up your past. Okay, somebody, come on. That is incredible stuff. That is absolutely wild and incredible. And some of you, I'm, I'm just letting you know. I'm just getting real with you right now. Some of you are trying to walk into your future with a shovel in your hand. Busy digging up your past. You're trying to walk into your future, but you're stuck in the same spot digging up your past. You know, your past. You're digging up your past relationships every time you're trying to get into a new one. You're digging up past the fence. You're digging up past wounds, stuck with a shovel in your hand, unable to move through the doorway because you're holding onto your shovel, the tool for which you are digging up your own demons, your own things, the things that should be in the past and left there. You're stuck there. You can't fit through that door with a, with a shovel in your hand, walking into new relationships with a shovel, walking into new churches with the shovel, thinking about old offenses from your old place and holding people, uh, holding it against people that don't even know what you're thinking about. Amen. I'm sorry. Start, not sorry. <laughs> you're walking into the new grade. You know, you're walking into sixth grade and now you got a grudge against your teacher because your fifth grade teacher was mean. Shovel it up, baby. Shovel it up. Dig it up. Let's go. Walking into new jobs. Walking into new jobs with a shovel in your hand, keeping that resentment, keeping that offense, because you got a shovel in your hand, you're not able to move into the future that God has always been calling you to go to, because you're stuck with the shovel in your hand. What would happen if we threw down the shovel and declared, my past is not my future, my, what has been holding me back in the past, this offense from the past is not going to hold me back any longer, but I'm going to choose to move forward and put down the unforgiveness, put down the offense, and say, you know what, Lord, I am ready to do what you did from that cross, Amen. and let go and forgive the people who are trying to ruin my life and treating me unjustly. Amen. The first last word that leads to breakthrough is you have to forgive you have to forgive. It'll become a bitter root. Everyone say bitter root. Bitter root. Bitter root. There's one thing you should be using a shovel, a shovel for. is digging up bitter roots. Digging those bitter roots up and out and getting them out of your life as fast as you can. That's what we ought to be doing. Hebrews 12, 15 says this. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root. Say it again. Bitter roots. This is important. No bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, offenses are like weeds. Offenses are like weeds. When they're new and fresh and it's been raining a little bit, they're easy to pull out. You just whoop, pull them right out, man. But you see them there, there's some bark, you know, the weeds in the bark where it's kept moist and they're just this tall. You just pull them out with two fingers, man. It's easy. But if you're anything like me and you uh, don't appreciate yard work <laughs> and you don't appreciate yard work, I mean, look at me. You probably would have guessed that already. I get it. I get it. And you see a, a weed that's like as tall as Adam right here. It's like a weed like this. 
and it's as wide as it is tall, and you have to get your deadlift position on. You know what I'm talking about? Dads, come on, somebody right now. You know what I'm talking about. You get down there, you square your feet. You know, you set your legs, you set your back, and you get down there, down by the base, and it's like September, so it hasn't rained in four months, and you think, I got this. Honey, check this out. Check this out, honey. I got this. And you get down there. You can deadlift 300 pounds, but this weed, man, it's got special powers. So, okay, you get down there. Okay, hold on. And then you got to clean your hands because it's all stickly and prickly. And you get down. Nah! And then it, right from the base, it goes pop. And you say, look, hon, got it. Got it. Problem solved, right? Problem solved. Or if you're anything like me, here comes this weed right here. You get the lawnmower. <laughs> wow, it's good. It's good. Dude, that just makes it stronger, doesn't it? That's covering it up. That's like covering up an old, uh, you know, the fences from an old relationship with just a new relationship. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I, did I meddle just now? That's like getting over the offense from your old church just by just going to a new church. No, yeah. I'm sorry. That's, that's called superficial, a superficial fix because you haven't really forgiven that person in your heart, but you're trying to cover it up. I get that. Hold on a second. I get it. I get it. We've all been through some offenses. We've all been through some things that we not only need to be forgiven for, but we need to forgive. And it's so tough sometimes. Jesus shows us how to forgive people and, and that we need to do this. Look at what Jesus had to in, embrace in the last 12 hours of his life. These are some bitter roots that maybe you have to deal with too. Number one is betrayal. Betrayal. This is in your notes right here. These are some bitter roots. And see if you can relate with any of these. Betrayal. Maybe by someone close. Maybe by someone like Judas who was with them, who was with Jesus for three years and was his road dog. That's my, my best expression for that. It's his disciple. He was betrayed. Maybe you've been through something like that. Someone who was supposed to be there for you abandons you at the worst possible time. Maybe a false accusation. That's the next blank for you. False accusation. You ever been falsely accused of something? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of yeses up in here. You know, social media, been accused of something, a roundabout kind of way. Well, Jesus had to face that. Jesus had to face false accusation and unjust trial. You know, you know you didn't do it, but people said you did. How about rejection? How about just some flat out rejection? By the, by the way, no one came to Jesus' defense when he needed them most. All the people that said, especially Peter, we've been talking about Peter a lot lately, but Peter was the one who said, I'll never deny you. And where's Peter? He gone, man. He gone. He ran. A little girl scared him away so that he couldn't even defend his Lord. And we've been through that. You've probably been through that. How about this? This next one, this one's tough. Abuse. Abuse. I would never make light of this one. This one's really, really hard to talk about sometimes. Uh, you know, if there's anyone who's ever been abused physically and, and even emotionally, it was Jesus. You know, the scholars say that probably his, his rib cage from the back was showing because of the, because of the beating he went through. Um, he, he faced some abuse, and he still said, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, how about this last one, humiliation. Uh, the Bible says that he, he, cross, he endured the cross and, and even the shame, the shame. Because psychological abuse can be something different too. Have you ever felt humiliated? You know, have you ever felt like you just were put on the spot? And, and I, I know for me personally, that can be a really, a really tough one because, you know, my ego. <laughs> if anybody can relate with that, you know, you, you feel good about yourself. And then if anybody puts you down, you just feel like, oh my God, that person, eh. I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to relate with maybe what you feel like too. Maybe you feel that same way. Jesus went through mockery that we can't understand. We can't understand it. And he did all this, not just to pay for our sins, but watch this in Hebrews 2. That's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. Then when he came before God as high priest to get rid of people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself. All the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where help was needed. Whoa, wow, that's a whole nother twist. He didn't just do all this to pay for our sin, but he did all this so he can help us get through that pain that he had to experience himself. The pain and suffering of Jesus, we cannot understand. So no matter what, God can say, I understand and I can help you. And the scripture says that where help was needed, because guess what? You're not gonna feel like forgiving. I'm saying this a very specific way. You're not going to feel like forgiving, but we know in our minds we should. Like, I don't feel like forgiving my kids 
when they use my toothbrush to clean the toilet. I don't feel like forgiving them. Down here, I feel like cleaning the toilet with, with them. You know, I don't feel like, that's what I feel like doing. But in my mind, I know. In my mind, I know. I, I, come on, they're being cute right now. Come on. In my mind, I know forgiveness. And don't we? We know that forgiveness is right up here. But, but God can help us to move it from here down to here. Help was needed because, because, listen to this, in the same way of thinking, we should go. 1 Peter 4 says, since Christ suffered while, we, while he was in the body, strengthen yourself with the same way of thinking. I wonder if Jesus felt like forgiving them. Maybe he didn't. The Bible doesn't say. It doesn't, well, I mean, it, it talks about Jesus' feelings sometimes, but here it just said he did it. So maybe there's something to that. Maybe this is something we're supposed to do, not necessarily feel. The same way of thinking Christ had. And he thought and he spoke, Father, forgive them. Let me give you some clarifications on, on forgiveness because it might get convoluted a little bit. Forgiveness is not minimizing the seriousness of the offense. I need to tell you that because some of these offenses out here that are existing in your world that I don't know about, these are really bad things. These are things that were done to you that were absolutely they're not okay. Have you ever heard someone say that? I'm sorry. And then you say, it's okay. Or the kids say, it's okay. Forgiveness is not saying it's okay what you did. Forgiveness is saying I'm releasing you and myself. It's not minimizing the seriousness of the offense. It's not okay what they did. Forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation either. It's not because reconciliation takes two. Reconciliation means that, that two things that were separate are coming now together and you being reunited and it feels so good with the person who offended you, that's not necessarily the case because sometimes that person's passed away who offended you. Sometimes that person's not willing and then guess what? You're held hostage to that person not, well, I'm gonna wait for them to say they're sorry. <clears throat> nope, nope, that's not what you do. You forgive them before, during, and if they ever say they're sorry. It's not necessarily reconciliation, okay? Uh, forgiveness is not necessarily fair. It's not necessarily fair. I mean, if you want to play the fair game, then guess what? You have to pay for every sin you ever committed against anybody, including God. Uh, C.S. Lewis said it this way. This is on the screens for you. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in me. That's powerful, man. That means it's not, it's not about, oh, it's fair and you need to, no, 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 no. That person who hurt me, who offended me, I'm, I can let them go even if it wasn't fair. I can let them go. But forgiveness is also possible, okay? It's possible. Philippians 4.13, you know the scripture, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If you haven't heard that before, memorize it. <laughs> if you haven't heard that scripture before, write it down. Take the bulletin home with you. Put it on your mirror. Tattoo it on your forehead. Get, get it on you somewhere and go, I can do this. I can forgive the people who have hurt me. I can do this. And I'm gonna show you how. This is gonna be really important. Um, I've got three things that are gonna help you walk in forgiveness towards the people who hurt you. And it's, and it's three things that you need to do, all three of them, and they, they get harder as they go. So the first one's the easiest. They're, so it's three things you gotta do. You gotta trust me on this, okay? You gotta trust me on this. But the first one's the easiest. The first thing is pray for them pray for them. And I don't mean pray they get hit by an 18-wheeler. That's not what I mean at all. I mean pray for them. Pray for them. Um, it's not that kind of prayer. Listen to Matthew 5 uh, verses uh, 43 and 44. You have heard it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. Listen, you praying for them may not change their life, but I promise you it'll change yours. It'll change yours. It's impossible for you to be praying for someone, truly, genuinely praying for them, and to harbor resentment for them at the same time. I've tried. I've tried. There's, you think I'm not mad at some people? Come on. Come on. I'm, I'm a pretty normal guy, average guy. I got some people I'm mad at. All right? And, and when I choose to pray for them, something weird happens that I can't be mad at them. I can't hold the grudge against them while I'm praying. But then I stop praying and come back. But... <laughs> It's a practice. Like, I need to continually pray for them. And every time I think about them, I pray for them again. I pray for them again. Pray for them. Pray for them. It's impossible to harbor hatred towards someone you're actively praying for. That's why I always encourage, if you're, if you're really mad at your spouse or something, or this is so powerful in marriage. 
If, I mean, because marriage, I mean, that's where most of our fights exist anyways. Let's just be honest with each other. Um, that's where the real ones are. That's where the real hard stuff, no one knows you like your spouse. And when you're mad at them and they're like, well, they shouldn't, pray for them. Pray for them. It'll transform your heart. It'll transform your heart for them. It won't transform them. It'll transform you. Pray for your spouse, especially if you're having a rocky time. Pray for them. Make it a practice that you do right, right now. The second thing is this, getting a little bit tougher now. Number two is this, you gotta bless them. You gotta bless them. And this word bless, this is, a, this is verbal, okay? This is, this is, you're actually speaking good things about them. I told you it was gonna be tougher. <laughs> I told you it was gonna be tougher. Uh, it means to speak well of. The origin of the, of the word bless that I'm gonna read to you is verbal. Luke 6 says, but I tell you to you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Where have you heard that before? It's all over scripture. Bless those who curse you. I don't want to, <laughs> but Jesus said to do it. And I don't think he just said to do it so that I would suffer and, and do something that it's not fun. I think there's actually a benefit to it. Yeah. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Even if the curse that you really wanna say about them is more true than the blessing you're, you're forcing yourself to say about them, don't you dare curse them. This is next level stuff, but it's gonna get really, really easy for you to harbor uh, resentment and, and condemnation towards them when you're speaking. Like it's like you're, uh, it's like you're drying out the ground for the weeds. When you speak ill, like I'm praying for them, that dirty, rotten, scoundrel, nasty, hate them. You know, when you're speaking that way, you know, I'm praying for them, but you're not speaking well of them, you're still making the ground hard. You're still making the ground hard. When you choose to speak well of them, even if your words are very, very few, I know this is, I know this is getting kind of tough to speak well of those who persecute you, but it's like, it's like you're holding on to that shovel. You're still holding on to that shovel and not to dig out the bitter roots, to dig up the offenses and to bring them back up and to relive those offenses in your mind and heart all over again. Don't do that. Choose to change your language. Choose to... Choose to change what you say about the people who hurt you. They legitimately did. They hurt you, all right? But I'm giving you the solution to get healing in your own hearts here. Okay, the last one is the hardest one, by far. By far. It's do good to them. Like do, do good things for them. The people who hurt you. The people who absolutely did you wrong. You know, Jesus died for the sins of those who hung him on the cross. Did you, did you hear me? He died for him. This is not the funnest thing to have to preach <laughs> because I know you don't want to. I don't, I don't want to either, but this is God's wisdom. This is God's truth, and it's gonna set us free if we choose to walk in it. Romans talks about this at length. This is a longer scripture. Bear with me. Romans 12, 17 through 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends. Leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Oh, Jesus, why? Lord, why? Paul wrote this one, and so now we got two or three witnesses on this whole principle. Paul wrote this to us. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. Finally, something I want to hear. <laughs> but listen to this. Highlight this next verse in your Bible. Highlight it in the YouVersion Bible app. Do something. It says, do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Are you mad at somebody? Are you harboring resentment towards somebody? Are you offended towards somebody? You got to let them go. You gotta let them go and overcome evil with a good, a good thing. I, I wanna kinda round this off with a really tough story. And so I just want you to kinda hold on to your seats for a minute because this is a really tough story and it might actually really um, kinda hit you in a, in a, in a, in a deep place. And I, I'm, I'm not making light of it. I don't intend to make light of it. This is, real, this is a serious subject because we're talking about forgiveness and offense well, imagine the worst kind of offense that could be done to you and the worst kind of person or the worst person it could come from, someone who was so close to you, right? I have a story about a young girl who had faced abuse, sexual abuse, 
uh, for her whole childhood, her whole childhood. Um, she reports over 200 times by her own father that the, there was abuse that was taking place. And again, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry to have to talk about these things, but this is real life. You know, and the people have gone through this. If it's not you, maybe it's someone you love, someone you know. This is very, very important. That, uh, that we think about this. She reports over 200 times by her father. She remembers the exact number because she can remember every time in detail. So horrific. But she became a Christian. In, as she got older, she became a Christian and she had a big calling on her life. In fact, uh, she became a conference speaker. She became an author. She became someone you probably have heard of if you're in the Christian world at all. Her name's Joyce Meyer. Joyce Meyer. And she only really disclosed this about herself roughly 10 years ago and she was at a conference and she told everybody listen this this happened to me and she waited till her father had passed away already to begin sharing some of those details because she didn't want to shame him which is a whole nother thing but she she became face to face with this principle of doing good to those who persecute you and she knew who that was for her it's her father so she began to do good to him and the whole family, mom too, you know, mom was in there too with the offense. So she began to pay off all their debts, pay all their bills, bought all their groceries, bought them a house. You know, it's Joyce Meyer. And she became blessed, she became famous, and she blessed them, which is just bonkers to me. It's, to me, it's bonkers. It's crazy that she would do this. And for years, nothing. No thank you. No I'm sorry. No, you know what? You really turned out good. None of that. None of that. Until years later. When later in his elderly years, the father comes to her and says, I can't understand what's going on. But my heart is broken. And you've been so good to me. And I know what I did to you. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he confessed his sin to her and confessed faith in Jesus and got saved. She baptized him. Her father who abused her, she baptized him in water. Can you imagine this? He went to be with the Lord shortly after. He died and went to heaven instead of hell because of how she was led by the Holy Spirit. I can't imagine it. I, I can't imagine it. But she says this. this is, these are her words. I'm not sorry it happened anymore because it gave me a chance to realize what my suffering Savior went through and to realize I have the power of God working in me to forgive like he did. To forgive like he did. And I'm so glad my daddy is in heaven. Too much. I know that this is a tough message. It's a tough message to hear to forgive someone who really hurt you, to forgive someone who really offended you. And I've got people just like you who hurt me, and I need to remember to pray for them and to bless them and to do good for them. And, and how can we do it? By understanding this statement from Jesus out of Matthew 10 8. He said, Freely you have received, freely give. You've been forgiven much. I know I have. I didn't get into rehab for being a golden boy, you know. I hurt people. And people hurt me too. I had a lot of offense, a lot of resentment. And when I got saved, I realized my whole life started over. I had a fresh, I had a fresh start. I had a clean slate. And nobody was holding it against me. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. The Bible talks about this. There was a woman who... who who gave everything that she had to Jesus because she had been forgiven much. And those who are forgiven much, forgive much. And listen, I'll never have to forgive anyone more than Jesus forgave me. And you'll never have to forgive anyone more than the Father has forgiven you. The forgiven forgive. If you are forgiven and if you know you're forgiven, then you're going you're gonna to look deep down inside and know you have the power to forgive as well. If you can see yourself as someone who's been forgiven much, you will be able to forgive much and you can free yourself from the prison of offense and unforgiveness. 
I want to pray for you today and I want to pray that you would receive the forgiveness that God has to offer you, but also that you would have the ability to forgive those who are holding it against you. You know, the Lord's prayer goes something like this. Forgive me of my sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. You remember that? You remember that? So that's what I want to pray today. The, today's closing prayer is, is twofold. Is that you would let go of something and receive something all at once. That you would let go of something and receive something all at once. If there's anyone here that needs to let go of some offenses that are maybe even very old, very old offenses. If there's anyone here that needs to receive the same kind of forgiveness I, I received as a, as a person who's been in jail, a person who's been in rehab, a person who's hurt so many people, I receive forgiveness. If you need forgiveness too, I pray you would receive it today. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me and I'm gonna pray over you. Father, I just pray right now for open hearts. First of all, to release, to release the offense that's come against us, to release the, the, the resentment that we've been hanging on to, maybe even for years. With heads down, eyes closed, if, if, if you're ready to let go of some things, would you just lift your hand with me and say, I'm ready to forgive. I'm ready to forgive. Come on, this is your chance. Amen. 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 Put your hand down. In light with that, we're going to partner this together. If you also are ready to receive that kind of forgiveness and maybe come into God's family for possibly the very first time, or maybe you're going to come back into God's family. God has much to say about that too. You are not looked down on if you're ready to come back into God's family as well. If you are ready to receive forgiveness and make Jesus your Lord and your Savior. Would you just lift your hand up too? I want to pray for you too. Amen. I see. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray this prayer together. If you just would repeat after me and, and just pray this prayer and let it be your own. Let it be from your own heart. Let it be from the deepest place within you to extend the forgiveness and both receive it. Say, Father God, I release those who have hurt me and abused me and treated me poorly. I know you have forgiven them and me. So Lord, I ask forgiveness of my sin and that you would make me new and fill me with your spirit and show me the path that I should take. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Amen.